about 40 years or so ago, the U.S. military launched 24 satellites, which became the basis for a navigation system used by the military. Over the time, it came to be known as GPS, the Global Positioning System. A GPS works in any weather, anywhere in the world, 24 hours a day. It was turned over for civilian use in the 1980s, and now we have it everywhere. When it first came out, remember the, uh, the garments you'd buy and put on your dashboard, and, and now... Uh, I don't know about you, we've got it on our phones now. You, you know, the garments were 100 plus dollars or 200 but now you just get a free app for your phone. And uh, through this system of what now is 20, I think 31 satellites that orbit about 12,000 miles above the Earth, uh, we can use receivers to figure out where we are at any moment in time to a, an accuracy of somewhere under 10 meters. That's amazing. It's also been a traumatic experience for a lot of us men. <laughs> My brother visited recently, and when he was getting ready to go home, he was going to go back a different route to see one of his sons, and he pulled out maps and, um, you know, an atlas and all that, and I, I thought, well, I miss that, you know? You know, b back in the day when it was an adventure, and, you know... Uh, only the man, only the head of the household could get you where you needed to go. I know that's true in my household anyway. But when the GPS came out, uh, knowing my wife's challenges in that uh, area and my daughter's challenges in that area of you know, reading maps and understanding north, south, east, and west and such, uh, which was just, you know, imprinted on my brain, but uh, they needed help. So uh, we, we got one of those devices, and not too long after that, we went on a visit of a, in a city uh, not too far from here, but I was unfamiliar with it, and, and my wife turned on the garment. I, I knew where we were supposed to go. I, I would have got us there. But she felt compelled to turn on the garment, and, and we were motoring along, and it was giving us uh, a direction, and finally it said, turn right the next exit, and I said, there's no way that could be right. I was wrong. <laughs> An hour later, I did get us there, but uh, if I would have just, I would have just been able to, in my mind, in my heart, trust the doggone thing, we would have been there a lot sooner. Now, here's the thing about GPS. We use the Waze app a lot. Uh, you may have it in your automobile. The thing is, if you do what it says, unless there's some software problem or something goes haywire, I mean, if you do what it says, you're going to arrive where you intend to go. But if you decide you're going to do it your own way and turn it off or ignore it, You know, to top matters off, they put a woman's voice on those things, you know? It's like a slap in the face to us guys, right? But if you do not heed the thing, because it is accurate, it does work, if you do not do what it says, you're going to do the wrong thing, probably. Not necessarily, but there's a good chance. That, that, that map in our mind, fellas, is, is, is just not quite as accurate as we'd like to believe it to be. Obedience to the direction we're given, whether it be GPS or a map, if, if you can obey, if you can take the facts and act accordingly, you'll be all right. Now, that's a simplistic illustration of what I'm going to talk about this morning. Because what I want to talk about is obedience. Obedience. 
So far, all the way through chapter 1, Peter has been giving us theological depth, amazing description, eloquently penned by the fishermen of all people, yes. A masterful piece of scripture in chapter 1. Talks about all about of our salvation. Repeatedly talks about our salvation. But in the midst of chapter 1, here and there, there's those nuggets of gold you kind of run across that are so very practical. And he, he talks about holiness, which we tend to think is some, uh, you know, high and mighty thing that we'll never attain to. But Peter just breaks it down into the easy to understand practicalities. And he says, look, holiness begins in your mind. You've got to gird up the loins of your mind, chapter 1, verse 13. You've got to prepare yourself for what you face in this world. Now, a prepared mind, a mind with the, that is girded up and ready for what it faces in this world, will not be conformed to the world's way of doing things, which is his next point. And then after describing all of that process of holiness and, and uh, uh, nonconformity and having a biblical worldview, he then, as we noticed last week, really brings it down to a practical level and he says, look, this all boils down to loving one another. Loving one another. And we talked about that last week. Now, as we move into chapter 2, the first thing he says is, therefore, in verse 1. Now, that is a conjunction that puts you back in the context of what he has just said about loving one another. So there's a very real connection to the first three verses in chapter 2 to what he has just said at the end of chapter 1. But at the same time, the first three verses in chapter 2 expand what he is saying and makes it even more practical and even more down to earth so that we know and can see for ourselves in plain English as it is in our translation uh, what God expects out of us as redeemed believers who are to live holy lives with minds unconformed to the world around us. And where he begins is with this matter of maturity. And he emphasizes, before he's done here in these three verses, that spiritual maturity that we need to be developing day by day. You see, holiness is positional. We're holy before God based on the blood of Christ. It's also practical. We have a, a practical aspect of living our lives day by day in, in accord with God's Word. And the more we do that, the stronger we get. And with the Spirit's help and grace, we become more and more mature, more and more Christ-like over time. Yet I would uh, not hesitate to say that one of the greatest problems, perhaps the greatest problem among Christian people in the world today is this one simple thing, immaturity. Some would say, well, it's a lack of evangelism. Some would say, no, our biggest problem is a lack of faithfulness. Others would say, no, uh, it's a shortage of giving, or it's a poor home life, or it's a need for revival, or it's this, or it's that. But it boils down, in every case, if a person is truly born again, to a lack of Christ-likeness, a lack of holiness, and in the, on the practical side of things, a lack of growth, Christian growth and maturity. Why does such immaturity persist? A lack of obedience. It is so simple. Obedience produces maturity over time. But it's hard work. It, it's something that has to take place every day. It's a battle. It's a struggle on a daily basis, on an hourly basis, on a momentary basis. Simple in terms of understanding it, difficult in terms of applying it to our lives. So, that all being said, let's look at the first three verses of chapter 2, and we're going to notice here that we're talking about spiritual growth, which is the result of obedience. 
So the point that Peter is making is simply this. Spiritual growth requires obedience. Obedience is the only way to obtain spiritual growth. There's no shortcuts. There's no super wonderful spiritual experience and just bam, now you're Christ-like. No, it doesn't happen that way. It's hard work. And it is the result of obedience over time. But what manner of obedience? There are two commands given in verses 1, 2, and 3. Two basic commands that Peter sets before us. And we must be obedient in these two things, in these two commands. We have to fulfill these two responsibilities to make any progress spiritually. So what manner of obedience? Well, we could just simply say there's two simple, specific steps of obedience that we need to be mindful of, that we need to apply to our life. So here they are. Let's begin. Number one, we have to forsake sin. It doesn't get any more basic than that. Forsake sin. Peter says, therefore, therefore, laying aside, there's your command. He says, the first thing you have to do is you've got to set some things aside. You've got to forsake some things. You've got to walk away from some things. You have got to separate yourself from certain ways of thinking, certain things uh, that you're used to doing, separate yourselves from the way the world thinks, separate yourselves from the way the world acts, and become separated from the world in, in your mind, beginning there, and then flowing through to your conduct. And that's what holiness is. We described that earlier. So forsake sin. Now, he begins by saying, laying aside all malice. All malice. Now, malice is a word which indicates sin in general. It's a general word, word that covers all sorts of evil. So what Peter says here, he says in the very broadest and the most general of terms, and we, he's going to make it more specific in a moment. But I want to give you an illustration here that will help you picture this in your mind and help you remember what we're talking about. Now, this is a, a rude little, uh, I mean, a rough little drawing of a sailing ship. You, you've got the sail, you've got the helm, and here, this is the anchor down here. Right here is what we want to talk about, the anchor. Sins... Keep us in place like an anchor anchors a boat in one spot. If you do not deal with the weight of sin, the anchor of sin that is holding you back from spiritual growth, you won't go anywhere. Your ship is going to set there in one spot. So sins hold us back from sailing the Christian life. Sins weight us down. You've got to hoist that anchor or just cut the rope if that's the case. You know, think of it however you want. But you've got to free yourself up to grow and you cannot do that and hold on to sin. And herein is the fallacy that overcomes many a believers. They think that they can hold on to God with one hand and hold on to the world with the other hand, and they're going to be okay. But that only does one thing. It brings about stagnation. It brings about an impossibility in regard to growth and Christ-likeness. And it constitutes a failure to be holy and it even intrudes on your ability to love one another, as we're going to see in a moment. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, a very familiar passage, which is roughly similar 
uh, to what we are reading here that you may be very familiar with. Romans, or excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Uh, Therefore, he says, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run the race with endurance that is set before us. You can't run the race if you're weighted down. You can't run the race with a set of barbells over your shoulder. You have to weigh, you have to lay aside the weight. And he says the weight is sin here in Hebrews 12. Well, Peter's saying basically the same thing with a little different wording here in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says lay aside, set it apart, cut yourself loose from it. Do not hold on to it. Do not let it hold you back or anchor you down. Now, that understanding, let's talk a little bit more about what he says it is that we should lay aside. First of all, we know that he says, lay aside all malice. It's the Greek word which means evil or sin in the broadest sense. Look carefully, or else look at the screen one as I read, verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice. And then notice he says, all deceit. And then he says, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking. The all sets apart three categories almost, if if you will here. The broadest general sense of sin, malice, whatever it may be. But Peter wants to narrow it down specifically to his readers. So he says all deceit. Deceit could be, we could use the word guile, or the word trickery. Um, Here, if we wanted to, as a translation. You remember what Jacob did to his brother Esau? When uh, he and his mother concocted the idea of fixing the porridge and, you know, and, uh, and putting the lamb's wool on his arms and around his neck and, uh, he he pretended to be uh, his brother Esau, the oldest. Now, Isaac had a problem because Esau had already lost at least part of his, his what was due him. But Isaac wasn't recognizing that. Isaac was prepared to give it all to Esau. And uh, so, in a sense, uh, Esau didn't deserve it. But uh, Jacob should not have tried to get it through trickery or through guile. Uh, he... Because of his father's failing eyesight, he deceived his father. So, from malice to deceit. Now, deceit, listen to this, deceit is the fuel the world runs on. Lying, cheating, tricking, scheming, manipulating, that is what the world thrives on. That is how the world, in the world's mind, you succeed in life. You take everything you can get from somebody else without them really understanding the, what you've just done. <laughs> you don't have to face any repercussions. You, you treat somebody else like dirt. You, 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 you steal them blind and act like you're innocent. Blame somebody else. Excuse yourself in some way. Justify it. That's the way the world operates. So he's going from from the the broad umbrella of sin and he's narrowing it down a little bit and he's talking about that state of mind we must not be conformed to. Uh, We read about it back in chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Then he adds three 
other specific sins. Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is pretending to be something you're not. It was a Greek word that was first used to refer to actors back in those days, the early Greek and Roman Empire. Pretending to be something or somebody that you're not. And then he adds envy. Now, that's just simply desiring to have what somebody else possesses. Uh, Where did that begin? I think that was the Garden of Eden, wasn't it? (laughs) She saw that it was pretty, beautiful, pleasing to the eyes. She wanted to possess it. And then evil speaking. Evil speaking is, again, another broad term that would cover... uh, Backbiting, uh, character assassination, slander, unjust criticism, uh, complaining, uh, arguing. You you can put it in there anywhere. Now, what is it that hypocrisy, envy, and evil speaking have to do in the context of that would cause Peter to put them in here under the two more general terms. Do you remember what we said in verse 1, the very first word, therefore? He's looking back to what he just said. And what did he just say in the previous verses? We ought to do what? Love one another. And when we are hypocritical, we're not treating our brothers or sisters right. We're not being true. We're not being honest. We're not being open with them. And we are feigning this or that for our own good. If we are envious, we are desiring to have what someone else has instead of rejoicing with those who rejoice. And I don't even need to talk about the other one because that's the one that catches up with all of us way, way too often. And all those three speak specifically and pointedly back to what he just said about our responsibility to love one another. If you cannot love your brothers and sisters in Christ, you cannot attain unto Christ's likeness. You cannot become holy. You cannot experience sanctification on a progressive basis. You're stymied, you're stuck, you're anchored down. Your sin has rendered you immovable. And you need to lay aside the anchor, hoist the anchor, cut the rope, put aside the sin, walk away from it. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, John says, If we confess our sin." He, that is God, he will, he is what? Just and righteous. And he'll forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, John is talking to believers there, to people that have already been born again, people that have a security as far as their eternal salvation is concerned, but their daily walk with the Lord is stained by sin. And they need to confess that, admit that, uh, own up to that. Seek God's forgiveness for that. Say what God is saying in that regard. That's what confess means, to say the same thing as God is saying to to you through the Spirit and in your heart and soul. And when you do that, then you are going to be forgiven. You're going to be cleansed. You're going to be released. The anchor is going to be dropped. And you're going to be able to make progress in your spiritual life. So drown your pain, as the song said, and every stain in the mercy flood. That's First John 1, 9. Whatever it is, deal with it. Forsake it. Confess it. But there's a second responsibility. There is another obligation here before us, beginning in verse 2. First, he says, forsake sin. Secondly, he says, feed on the Word. Feed on the Word of God. The problem we often have is 
we put all the emphasis on feeding on the Word of God. How often do we quote 1 Peter 2, 2? As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word that you may grow thereby. How often do we refer to it? How often do we think about it and, 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 and quote it in talking about a necessity of, of studying the Word of God and, and applying it to our life? And we forget about the first half of the equation. If you're anchored by your sin, you're not going to make any progress because you go to the Word. This is why we have Christians that spend their whole life in church and they hear sermon after sermon, Sunday school lesson after Sunday school lesson. They read their devotions day by day and they make no progress because they haven't cut the anchor. And feeding on the Word will only propel you forward when you forsake sin. Here's another little sailing ship. I'm assuming it must have some other power besides the sail because it's moving forward. But uh, you notice the sail right here is not at all unfurled. Well, the other side is of this two-part equation. Not only must you forsake sin, you have to feed on the Word. And if you're not feeding on the Word, then your sail looks like this. You, you can't be propelled forward. The Spirit of God cannot gain His authority and power in your heart and soul, and He cannot produce within you your spiritual growth and your sanctification on a progressive basis if you are not in the Word. And so Peter says, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the Word. Now look at it again. Look at it again. Because what I have done is in the outline is I have, I have simplified it and said feed on the Word. But you never feed on anything until you have a desire to feed on it. How many of you... Oh, boy. When I was a kid, I used to hate spinach. Now, you, you understand. Uh, spinach, to me, as a kid, was in a can. And I'd throw it in a skillet, maybe put a little vinegar on it, and oh, it's just horrible. I still hate it to this day. Now, I love spinach salad, the fresh stuff. You think of whatever it is that you hate to eat. Is there, any, is there anyone here? I probably are some several people. But, but how many people would really say, I, I like everything? No, there's, there's something most of us don't like. There may be a few people who just eat whatever. And I have learned to be that way more so as I've grown up, except I'm not going to eat that dog on spinach out of a can. I don't care how old I get. We feed on what tastes good to us. That's why he says desire. I noticed my, my little grandson last night. It was after supper sometime. And uh, he's, he's not sucking on a bottle. He's got a little sippy cup. And it was full of formula. It must have been eight ounces. He was just standing over there, leaning back on the stool. I'm down there thinking about ten minutes. I'm thinking, holy. That's the kind of desire we need to possess for the partaking of God's Word. You wake up on Sunday morning and say, oh, geez, Sunday, i got to get out of bed. i got to go to Sunday school. I've got up all week long. I'm tired. Or do you say, praise God, I have an opportunity to learn, to grow, to partake of the Word of God. Well, what about the rest of the days of the week, for that matter, when you have an opportunity to do that on your own? Is there that desire there to partake of the Word of God? Now, now nobody has to teach a baby. Uh, I mean, I, babies are just born with a desire for mother's milk. It, 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 or, you, know, they, they, you know, as they grow, they, they learn not to eat spinach, but, you know, things like that. How, how are we to foster a desire for the Word of God? You know, 
I grew up, my mom and dad drank coffee, but I always thought that was the most that, that awful tasting stuff. Uh, they, they never let me drink it when I was a kid, but the time I got a little older, I was probably if I drank that. And, uh, and then I got to visiting good church people and stuff, and they'd give me a cup of coffee, and, you know, what are you going to do? You go, you go, be sociable. So you just start to drink a little bit, and then at work, and the first thing you know, guys, it's all gone. I got to like the stuff. Now, I'm no gourmet coffee drinker. I, I'm not going to pay, you know, 3 or $4 for my coffee. Now, I, I'm, it's probably worth it, but I'm just too cheap for that. That's not going to happen. But I do have my little Keurig, you know, and I got those little 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 cups, and they're expensive enough. They're probably a dollar a piece. Uh, and, and now I've got to the point I can, I can, I can really discern what, what kind I've put in the coffee maker. And... Uh, <clears throat> Some days I like this kind. Some days I like this. I got about four or five. What happened? I developed a desire, a taste for coffee. Which, by the way, is worthless without a little bit of half and half. But, uh, you know, it all goes together. How are we going to develop a desire for the Word of God? You've got to have a little bit of it. And once you have a little bit of it, and you discover, that's not so bad. Well, I'll have a little bit more. And you have a little bit more, and you say, that's actually pretty good. And you have a little bit more, and you say, that's pretty amazing. And you have a little more, and you have a little more, and you, you get to the point where you cannot, you cannot help yourself. You are soaking in, absorbing, partaking of the Word of God on a regular basis because... It is so good. So, if you haven't got to that point, you've got to face the fact it's a hard battle, it's a discipline you've got to develop, it's got to start somewhere. But it could be your problem is not with tasting it's good and wanting more. Your problem might be you haven't dropped the anchor of some sins. Because the two work together. This ship has not any anchor holding it back. It's actually moving in the water. It probably has a little motor in there. But it's never going to sail like it's intended to sail for the pure joy of sailing unless they raise that sail. But who's going to be crazy enough to get in a boat and raise the sail and the anchor is still down? I can imagine me. I can imagine us being forgetful enough, but doing it on purpose, you're not going to make any progress. So, forsake sin. Feed on the word, and when you feed, you're going to grow. See, <clears throat> desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, <laughs> there, there's what I was talking about. You develop the desire by doing a little tasting. When you taste the goodness of God and you see the grace of God and you see the times that God's answered prayer and, and, and you see the truth of God's word which begins to transform your heart and soul and you get a taste, the desire grows. It takes both. They both have to operate. You can't unfurl the sails and get anywhere if the anchor is still holding you back. And it does you no good to deal with sin if you don't desire the Word. You'll never have the wind in your sails. Pretty simple. Here's a story. It's utterly amazing. It comes out of an evangelist's book. Uh, the evangelist named Robert L. Sumner. I'm sure he's with the Lord now. He wrote a book many years ago entitled The Wonder of the Word of God. And he tells a story in that book, a true story of a man living in Kansas City, Missouri, who was severely injured in an explosion. His face was badly disfigured. He lost his eyesight, and he lost both hands in the explosion. He had just become a Christian. His greatest disappointment as a new believer was he could no longer read his Bible. He was blind. He couldn't even learn Braille because he didn't have any hands. 
Well, he heard or read somewhere of someone in a similar situation that learned to read Braille using their lips. So he ordered a Bible in Braille, and he began to run his lips over it. And to his horror, he discovered that the nerve endings in his lips also were damaged. and couldn't read Braille that way. But in his effort, somehow or another, he touched his tongue to it, and he realized he had feeling in his tongue. So he began to learn to read Braille with his tongue. And at the time that Sumner published this book, this man, using his tongue, reading Braille, had read through the Bible five times. That's the kind of desire we need for the Word of God. That's the kind of desire that will go along with the forsaking of sin and produce it. And one feeds the other. And only then are we able to unfurl completely, anchors hoisted, and be able to sail to the destination we're headed to. And in, in terms of what Peter's talking about, that's Christ-likeness, holiness of life. 